Well, what a wonderful day for the Ellis family and the Gunn family on this very special moment together. And we praise God for all these baptisms as God reaches down from heaven and claims these little ones as his own. Let's begin in a word of prayer today. Lord, we, we ask you to be with us in this hour that we might hear from you through your word and that you would touch our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we uh, enter into this new year, uh, so many people uh, have New Year's resolutions, right? Maybe you have a New Year's resolution. And um, someone said the problem with New Year's resolutions is they often collide with old year habits. And uh, I find that to be true. But um, we make these promises to ourselves, don't we? And isn't it strange that we make these promises and so often we don't keep them? We make promises to ourselves and we don't keep them. That's kind of an odd thing to think about, really. And maybe uh, the, the reason we do this is because we know down deep in our heart there's something missing. I think the reason we have these resolutions is we know that we're lacking and we fall short and there's a part of us that's, that's broken and needs to be filled. And, and so we kind of tinker around the edges and kind of tweak this and change that and, and it... And it even if we keep the promises, it never really seems to be fulfilling. Because the truth is, there's a hole in our soul, and the only one that can fill it is God. And so it seems to me we need something more than New Year's resolutions. And we're, we're talking in this season now about living our greatest life. And in these weeks ahead, I want to talk about the, the biblical concepts and principles that can help us live our greatest life, that can take us to a higher level and give us what we're really looking for and longing for in all those New Year's resolutions. So I want to begin today with a, with a particular principle. And um, we learn of it initially, really, from uh, uh, a prophet by the name of Ezekiel. We don't talk a lot about Ezekiel, uh, but uh, he's worthy of our attention today. He writes at the time of the Babylonian captivity with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, capturing the people, and he, he writes a word of prophecy to tell them to repent and that God will restore them if they repent. And, um, and my late professor, Dr. James Callis, my mentor, uh, when he preached on the book of Ezekiel and taught on it, he pointed out, for example, that in chapter 18 of Ezekiel, that Ezekiel becomes, you could almost say, the first theologian to begin talking about the individual, the responsibility of the individual. Prior to that, everybody had this collective idea that, you know, the brokenness of our life, maybe the sin of our life, is caused by those who lived before us. It's like when they asked Jesus about the blind man. Is he blind because of what his parents did or because of what he did? And so there was this collective idea. But Ezekiel is the first to write in chapter 18. It's really about the individual. When he writes, uh, speak, God speaking through him, and God says, tell the people of Israel, stop saying our fathers ate sour grapes and put our teeth on edge, he says in chapter 18. In other words, our situation quite often is due to ourselves. Our situation is due to our rebellion, due to our pride, due to our arrogance, due to our hubris. That's often the problem, not somebody else, but we ourselves. And, um, and so you see a little bit through the scriptures, a progression of revelation to where God reveals himself and more and more about who he is and who we are. And there's a, a good example with Ezekiel. But Ezekiel is this eccentric guy, ex eccentric prophet. He will... Uh, lie on, one, on his left-hand side for 390 days and teach. I don't plan to do that here. And then he turns and he lies on his other side for 40 days. At one point, he cuts off all of his hair and he throws a third of it in the fire and a third of it to the wind and another third, I'll, I don't even know what he does with it. And then he eats these concoctions of cakes that he puts together. And there's all these strange and odd things that he does as a part of his teaching and his prophetic ministry. And some have suggested that he does it because he's trying to gather people's attention. 
uh, like a lot of communicators and preachers and teachers. Maybe uh, he's using a story or maybe using a, a video clip on the video screen, trying to get people's attention and hold on to their ADD wandering minds. But um, the problem becomes, as, as God will speak through the prophet, the problem becomes is they, they only want the entertainment value now. They're only interested in the show. They only want to be amused. And you know what the word amused means when you, you break it apart. Muse means to think. And the A in front of it is an alpha privilege which negates the word. It means not to think. And so when we're being amused, we're not thinking. And, and the prophet, God is speaking through him about him saying, the people are really not listening. They're just wanting to be entertained. They're just wanting to be amused. And so with that said, I want to read what God says to the prophet Ezekiel in chapter, uh, chapter 33, verses 30 to 33. God speaks to Ezekiel, really about Ezekiel, in these words. He writes, as for you, mortal, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses say to one another, each to a neighbor, come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. They come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they will not obey them. For flattery is on their lips, but their heart is set on the gain, on their gain. To them you are like a singer of love songs, one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. They hear what you say, but they will not do it. Then they will know that a prophet has been among them when this comes about. And so Ezekiel is saying, or God is saying to Ezekiel about the people, yeah, they're listening, but they're only wanting to be entertained. And the evidence is that they will not do what I've asked. They will not obey me and do what I've asked. They flatter the preacher, he says. They flatter the preacher, but their heart is on what's in it for them. He says it's even like maybe going to a concert and you hear this marvelous music, but it, it never changes anything. It doesn't transform anyone. It doesn't really do anything for anyone. You know, I, I think about that more and more as I I hear the stories from time to time about some rock musician of the past who's died and they play his music again for a while, you know, like Jimmy Buffett died and recently and, you know, we're reminded about wasting, wasting my way again in Margaritaville, looking for my lost shaker of salt. Some say it's a woman to blame, uh, but I know it's my own, I'll clean it up, darn fault. You know, we know the words. We know the words of that better than we know the Bible. We, we can't even quote the Bible, but we can quote Jimmy Buffett. And then you got to ask as you hear about he died, and you want to say, really, Jimmy, that's it? That's all your life really amounted to? That was the life-transforming message, wasting away in Margaritaville. That's all you got? Maybe there should be something more. And yet we venerate these people. We honor these people. Millions will be spent buying tickets to see Taylor Swift. And someday when her, she's no longer as popular and famous, and maybe when she dies, everybody will say, well, what was the big deal? What was really the point? What was really the message? And God is saying to the prophet Ezekiel, that's what they're doing to you. It's just like music that goes in one ear and out the other, and they're just amused. And the evidence is they're not obeying what I've asked. And so this becomes the key to understanding how we live our greatest life now. It's to obey him, to obey him. Jesus speaks into this in John, I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 6, in Luke 6, 46 to 49. Jesus says this, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? 
Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Isn't it fascinating that we'll say, I believe Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I believe he is my Lord and Savior, and yet we will not do what he's asked us to do. He's asked us to live maybe in certain ways. He's asked us to live a certain lifestyle, but we're going to do what we want to do. When was the last time we stopped and asked, God, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to make that career choice? Do you want me to make that career change? Do you want my kids to go to that university? Do you want my do you, do you want me to move out of state? What, what is it you want me to do? We don't stop very often and say, God, what do you really want? Am I living the way you're asking me to live? See, Lord, Lord, it's got to be more than just a title. It's got to be an action. And, uh, you know, it's football season. And I was reading, you know, today Dallas is playing and I was reading a little about Roger Staubach recently, and the greatest, uh, one of the great players, uh, quarterbacks for the Cowboys through the years, and, and maybe of all time even. But um, Staubach said later after he retired, he said the greatest frustration he had playing for Dallas was that he could never call his own plays. He said Tom Landry was a genius coach, but he sent in all the plays. I could never call in a play. And I knew what I was doing. I was pretty good at what I was doing. But I could never call a play, unless it was an emergency. If I, I could change it up in an emergency, but I had to be right. <laughs> I could never call my own plays. And it really bothered him for a long time. He didn't know how to handle it. didn't know what to do with it. And then he said this. I faced up to the issue of obedience. And once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. And I think that's true right here with God. Jesus says, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I've asked. And then he goes on in verse 47. He says, I will show you what someone is like who comes to me Here's my word and acts on them. So I'm going to show you what it looks like when somebody listens and does what I've asked. That one is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on rock. And when a flood arose, the river burst against that house, but could not shake it because it had been well built. He says, that's what it looks like. A person who builds their house not on sand, but on rock, and they have a foundation. Frederick Bruner, in his commentary on Matthew 7, that tells a similar story where Jesus tells it in a different way, says the house he, he promises will not be a house that glows in the dark, but it will be a house that when the trials and the vicissitudes of life and the, and the difficulties and the storm comes, it will not be knocked down. He doesn't promise the storm will skirt the house, that you'll avoid the storm. The storm is going to come, but your house will stand, and it will withstand the storm. That's the promise. And let me just tell you, maybe to this point in your life there haven't been any storms, but there will be a day when there will be a storm, a big one. That day will come. I've lived long enough and been with enough people in the crises of their life. I know that to be absolutely true. The storm will come. The question is, in these days, in this season, on what are you building the house? If it's your will and your desire and your plan, well, then he describes what that looks like in verse 47. He goes on. I will show you what someone is like who comes to me Here's my word and acts on them. And, uh, and then he goes on, he says, but the, in verse 49, he says, but the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And when the river burst against it, immediately, immediately it fell and great was the ruin of that house. That's what it looks like when I'm in charge and I'm the God of my own life. 
General Charles Duke, uh, many years ago, was one of the pilots that landed on the moon with Apollo 16. And he was interviewed many years later, and they asked him, what was it like to walk on the moon? You know, I, I can only imagine. I, I know I'd be scared to death. Uh, but what would it be like, they asked him, to walk on the moon? They asked him, were you able to do whatever you wanted to do? Could you have conducted your own experiments? Could you have kind of done whatever it is you wanted to do? And he said, not if you wanted to return back to earth. He said, the schedule was so tight, so intricate. Every detail was, was covered. Every second we lifted off was accounted for. In fact, it was so tight that when we landed on the lunar surface, we only had 60 seconds of fuel left in the lunar module. Yeah, you can do anything you want, but you might not return to earth. And I suppose you could say the same here. Jesus is saying, you can do whatever you want, but when the wind comes and the storm comes and the river comes, it'll knock down your house. And so if we want to know how to live our greatest life now, we begin to say, God, what do you want? We begin to study his word. We begin to look at his word and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? What is the lifestyle you would have me live? And the more I learn those principles and I live them out, I begin to live my greatest life now. Here's how the apostle Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 15, verse 5. I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 15. And he died for all so that all who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. We no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him. See, I think one of our challenges is we want to be the God of our own life, don't we? Uh, we don't really like how he runs things. We really think we could do a better job. I mean, we have here at Mount Avala 60 employees, and so a senior pastor that puts me in the role of an employer. And quite often I have people who work with us and work for us <clears throat> who can't delegate. <clears throat> they can't delegate. And I think what I, as I've examined this so many times, what I find is that their, their thinking, their attitude, their idea is no one can do it like I can do it. No one will do it with the excellence with which I will do it. Um, and then I think in the back of their mind, the idea is if, some, if I give this over to somebody else, then why am I here? And maybe I won't get credit and maybe I won't have the power I had. And you know, it looks a lot like how we deal with God, doesn't it? You know, he's not going to do it the way I want to do it. He's not going to do it on my schedule. I'm going to give up power. I'm going to give up recognition to delegate it to him. And yet, he asks us, if we want to live our greatest life now, he just says, do what I tell you. Be obedient. Do what I've asked you to do. Each year, we begin the year with something we call the big promise. <clears throat> and we know this works because so many people have done it. And the big promise is simply this. If you will allow Jesus to be the Lord of your life, meaning he's the one in charge, he's the one in control, you take orders from him, not you. If Jesus will be the Lord of your life, you'll worship regularly. That means you're here more than you're not. You'll get involved in Christian fellowship through a small group or a cluster group. And you'll find some place to serve the Lord in the confines of this congregation. Your life will be better one year from now. We make that statement because we know it works. We know that that works because it puts you on a new trajectory. It puts you on a new road. It's not just tinkering around the edges and making small modifications like a, a New Year's resolution. But it's a transformational change that has very powerful effects. And helps you lead your greatest life now. Let's pray together today. Lord, we thank you that you've got a plan for us. And sometimes, Lord, it's hard for us to understand it. But we know this, Lord, you love us more than we love ourselves. And sometimes when you tell us to live differently or tell us no, it's only because you love us more than anyone. Out of your great love for us, Lord, you want us to obey you. Not because you're power hungry, 
but because you're in love with us. So help us to understand this, Lord, and to take a new step in living our greatest life now. In Jesus' name, amen.